Welcome to the Wow Club. I'm Michelle Martin. Is India undergoing a sexual and marriage revolution? Are attitudes towards sex and marriage changing? My guest this evening is a contemporary Indian novelist and non-fiction writer, Ira Trivedi, in Singapore because of the Singapore Writers Festival. And we talked about her book, India in Love, a book which saw her traveling across India. It's the first piece of non-fiction after three works of fiction. The woman with an MBA from Colombia, the winner of the Felberg Fellowship, Ira Trevetti, tells me more about her thoughts on women's and men's changing expectations when it comes to love, marriage, dating, the pressure she herself feels as she approaches the end of her 20s towards finding a life mate and the role that yoga plays in her life. It's a wide-ranging interview. We say welcome to Ira Trevetti to the WOW Club. Welcome to Wow, a Women of Worth. I'm Michelle Martin, and sitting across me is Ira Trivedi, the best-selling author of What Would You Do to Save the World? The Great Indian Love Story, and There Is No Love on Wall Street. Her latest book and first work of nonfiction is India in Love, Marriage and Sexuality in the 21st Century, a landmark book on India's new social revolution in marriage and sexuality. Welcome, Ira. Hi, it's lovely to be here. Good to have you in Singapore. How would you describe the changes that you came across in research for this book? It took four years, took you to over uh, 12 cities, I understand. 15, actually. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. So how would you describe the sort of changes that you're seeing with regards to gender and attitudes towards marriage? Okay, so I think that India is going through a sexual revolution. That's what I found. And the magnitude of the sexual revolution is startling. But India's sexual revolution is not just to do with sex and sexual mores. It has something to do with marriage as well. Uh, In India, traditionally, marriage has always been linked with sex. Um, The the convenient little formula has always been you get married, you have sex, and then if you're lucky, you fall in love. If you're not lucky, you don't fall in love, but you continue living your life as is. But now that little formula has completely overturned, and it could be anything. You could fall in love, have sex, get married. You could get married, have, you know, have sex, and not fall in love. You could have sex, maybe or maybe not get married and fall in love. But anyways, you get the point. There's various permutations and con- co- combinations. So I do think that, that there are large changes that are happening right now. In fact, the kind of changes that we are seeing in India mm. that have been going on for the past 10 years um, is something that has not happened in the past 500 years. These sort of changes are really, um, really startling. What do you attribute the, the swift pace of change to? There's, there's several factors. There's, of course, um, consumerism, economics. India went globalization. through globalization, mm-hmm. westernization, the opening up of, 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 of media. India has a very robust, very liberated media. Um, of course, we're a large democracy as well. Um, you know, as I said, urbanization, India is going through rapid urbanization. And the next 10 years, India will see the largest rural to urban migration in the history of the world. So as all of these changes happening, India has a has a big growing middle class population. And some estimates say that by 2020, 2025, India will have the largest middle class population in the world. But let's not forget one of the things that I think is most critical is technology. Mm. You know, cell phones, the internet, that has opened up inform- you know, opened up the world to, the India, to Indians. And that's why I think this revolution is really happening at cyber speed. Your book focuses a lot on the middle class and you explain a little bit why because you see it as a key proportion of society in many rapid changes. And I think I've read you say, uh, a comment where you say you believe that these changes in terms of gender mores and ideologies are going to be led by the middle class. I do. I do. I d- so when I was writing, when I began to write India and Love, you know, I was really stumped. I said, my gosh, how do I cover love, sex and marriage for 1.3 billion people? Yeah. Is it possible? Yeah. Um, I said, first, I said, do I have a book or do I have one book or do I have a volume? You know, what do we have here? And I kind of realized that you have to focus. Um, urban India is very different from rural India. I, You know, rural India needs its own book. You know, India and love focuses on urban India. 
and the middle class, which I felt that, you know, these were the two most critical components of what the future would look like. Mm. So I wanted to look into the future and said, say, you know, who's going to lead this revolution? Mm. And what is an India of the future is going to look like? And in, if, if India in the future is going to be urban and middle class, or largely urban and middle class, and it's going to be the urban India, which is going to be leading the sexual revolution. Mm. And rural India will follow because rural youth look to urban youth, and that's mm. aspirational for them. What what place does caste play in, in terms of determining gender roles or the role of women? Even as we talk about the middle class, I'm sure caste permeates through that as well, or does it not? You know, so that's a very apt and good question. So for listeners who don't know what the caste system in India looks like, so it's 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 a very, you know, archaic and old, you know, it's it's in our scriptures, it's been an essential part of, of India, the caste system. The four big castes, which are Brahmins, which are the thinkers, the Kshatriyas who are the warriors, the Vaishyas who are the traders, and the Shudras who have <coughs> excuse me, who have typically thank you, who have typically typically been the untouchables in the labor class. This is now breaking down. So the middle so the middle class has led to the breakdown of caste. So no longer do we look at people as, hey, that's a Brahmin, or that's a Shudra, or that's a Vesha. You now look at people saying, hey, is this person an engineer or a doctor? What's their income level like? So I'm, for example, my family has been staunchly Brahmanical. There's not a single, in, in my lineage, there's not a single drop of non-Brahmin blood. You know, it's been generation after generation. But now, you know, and my parents have sort of come to that, mm. you know, and my for my sister, was four years older than me, who got married 10 years ago. It was unthinkable to marry someone who was not Brahmin. For me, those are, those rules no longer exist because I know that being Brahmin means nothing in today's world. It, what matters more is how much you make, what kind of mu- where you're educated, um, you know, what, are, what kind of family values do you have? Are you open-minded or closed-minded? Very similar to the way it's in the West. It's a class system now and not a caste system. And is this something that you encountered outside your own domestic sphere, as in, in terms of the other people that you research for your book, that class doesn't seem to matter, particularly when it comes to marriage choices? Definitely. I think when you, when you, when you speak to especially young you know, Indians who are on the marriage market mm. and you say, does caste matter to mm. you? They say, personally, caste doesn't matter to us. It never has in our education systems, in colleges. What matters to us more um, is compatibility. Mm. And we're more compatible with people who have a similar education to us. We're more compatible to people who, who have come from the same sort of income level as we do, which is natural, right? Which is what's happening world over. Add to your wow factor with Michelle Martin in the Wow Club on 938 Live. Ira Trivedi there, very interesting because her, her lens of analysis focuses very specifically on the middle class in contemporary India. We speak more about, well, the impact that sexual crime has had on a woman's ability to feel safe walking the streets in New Delhi. Women's change in terms of expectations for themselves when it comes to marriage. Uh, her own pressure towards marriage or the pressure she feels about getting married and finding a mate, the role that yoga plays in her life. It was really fascinating speaking with Ira Trivedi, who at the age of 19 went undercover, so to speak, in a Miss India pageant. She made it to the finals, by the way, um, because she was canvassing research for her book, which eventually um, she gave to the world. And the title of that book is What Would You Do to Save the World? It was Confessions of a Could Have Been Beauty Queen. She has so much to offer the world. Ira Trevedi, more of her thoughts after this. It's a great book that takes us to India and right into the perceptions of young individuals. Perceptions to do with sexuality and marriage and what they want for themselves, dating, you name it. Anything that you can think of under the umbrella of love, I think Ira Trevedi masterfully covers in her book, India in Love. Here's an excerpt. India is one of the world's youngest countries and its sexual revolution too is of the young. India's current population includes 315 million people who are under 25. 
And by 2020, India is slated to be the youngest nation in the world, with an average age of 29, compared with 37 in China and the United States, 45 in parts of Europe and 48 in Japan. It is an unprecedented demographic condition in its history, and in absolute numbers, it is unprecedented anywhere in the world. This demographic dividend is driving this revolution along with other factors and will continue to drive it in the future. The words of Ira Trevetti, author of India in Love, my guest in the WOW Club. What is urbanization doing to gender norms in terms of the realm of homes? Uh, are women still the major decision makers? Well, women, I don't think, have been the major decision makers. India t- was and is a patriarchal society. Um, I do think that some of this patriarchy... Even within the realm of the home? I think so. I mean, it's it's a patriarchal culture still, you know? Um, so does, does the decision makers have been men. Uh, I do think that that is changing now. You know, women are getting empowered. This is the first generation of young Indian women who are in the workplace. They're going to offices. I mean, women have always worked but in their, within their homes. But they're going to workplaces, they're earning their own salaries, they have their own lives. Mm. So I think this is one of the major reasons of the sexual revolution is that women are financially independent, economically independent, and that somehow makes them sort of mentally independent as well. Like they can make their own decisions and stand up for themselves. To what extent is religion buffering uh, existing social roles? There is, you know, that again is a very good question, Michelle. I think... Religion does play a part in it, you know, but um, traditionally the church or, or, or the, you know, the, has always, you know, till 150 to 200 years ago in the West, the church was a major decision maker in marriages, you know, but that's become less and less, you know, in Hinduism, for example, um, you know, religion is, is playing less of a role than it did earlier. I'm not saying that inter-religion marriages are still common. But, for example, we have laws now that let people marry, you know, within mar- marriages. It's a special marriage act. This didn't exist till 40 to 40 years ago. There was no hope of two people from different religions getting married. So I do think that that con- that, that there are changes being made in the legal landscape um, that allow people of different rel- religions to get married. And it's, it's, it's happening, happening slowly, but it's definitely happening. Is sexual violence still a deeply rooted problem that modernizing India is grappling with? Yes. Um, so what my theory is, is that as sex comes to the fore, it also plays a part. I mean, this also leads to sexual violence. So this is the dark side of the sexual revolution. Um, suddenly, you know, you look at billboards and they're sexually titillating. Women are out in the streets wearing skirts and dresses and Western clothing and you know, for but me, India gave the world the Mahara, um, the Kama Sutra. Excuse me. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. You're right. Yeah. So it's not. It's not exactly new, right? These it's not. Depictions but, of but the sex. Kama Sutra, for example, you know, if you go to for, there's a the, the the one of the oldest libraries in Delhi, you you know you see a pic, you know the, the Kama Sutra copies of Kama Sutra were burnt there, and if you see the Kama Sutra now in this ancient library in Delhi. You will see burnt pages. They've all they've censored all of it. So there was a large, large censorship that took place over the centuries in Indian society with Islamic rulers, with the British, with sort of prude Indians themselves. You know, sort of prude prude leaders themselves. So I do really feel that that um, sexual violence has played is part of India's sexual revolution, but people are also talking about sex more. Right? People are talking about sexual violence more. I don't think it's not like sexual violence didn't exist earlier. It did. Um, I do think it's increased increased a little bit because of urbanization and migration and clash of cultures. But the reality is that at the same time, um, it's being reported more and people are actually talking about it. It's come to the forefront. And that is why we hear about it. Five years ago, if a woman got raped, her family would tell her, don't go and tell anyone about it because you're going to bring shame to yourself, shame to your family. Your prospects of marriage are going to get completely negated. But now that's no longer the case. You know, women want to stand up for themselves and they want to report their crimes. So while it may appear to us and by numbers that rapes have gone up by 10 times, the reality is that reporting has gone up. Um, But I also do believe the instance of rape has gone up, but the reporting of it has gone up a lot more.
You said we need to have some major large-scale sex education programs and also more gender sensitization. The government is simply not doing enough. What do you think that sex education programs will be able to help the country address? Right now, there is no sex education. I mean, it is... No nationalized sex um, education. Almost negligible. There's nothing. I mean, I remember my sex ed, when that, that took place, it was, it was like nothing. So women have no idea, you know, how to take care of their bodies. You know, abortion is, if you look at abortion numbers in India, it's, it's, it's actually, it's, it's mouth dropping, you know. Um, and these are official numbers. And unofficial abortions in India are probably, you know, tenfold. So it's, it's, it's absolutely stunning because women actually don't know anything about, about, about sex, about taking care of their bodies, about taking care of, um, of, of the sexual health. So some of the cases that I came across were, were, were really sort of saddening. And, just, and you know, it, it made me feel like we really need to do something about this. Um, India traditionally has been very liberal in its abortion policy. And because of the population control, they've also sort of, you know, contraceptive, access to contraceptive has been very easy, unlike many other countries. Mm. But still, I think we really need to make sure that men and women know how to coexist properly, which they don't at the moment. You know, that's why we have so much sexual harassment, sexual violence, something called Eve teasing, which is uniquely Indian. Eve teasing? It's Eve teasing. What's that? Eve teasing is when, you know, you're on a bus and a man will comment or a man will accidentally touch you or where a man, you know, this has happened to all of us, including me. You know, where a man will so brush... So it ranges from verbal harassment to actual molestation Yeah, actual almost. molestation. But Eve teasing, it's this sort of this non... You know, they're not going to rape you. You know, it's not rape. But it's sort of harassment in that verbal form. In, in a, in a, it's, a, it's teasing. It's sexual teasing. But Even it's, it's the hardly, term, I think, trivializes yeah, it. And it tr- exactly. makes it sound as if a woman is almost supposed to be light about it yeah. and, and almost enjoy it. Exactly. It's as if a man is doing it out of a sort of a lighthearted, teasing way mm. and women are supposed to accept it. Mm. So it's, it's, you know, when a woman walks by, there'll be cat calls or a man will sort of, you know, rub his shoulder against you. Um, so I, I do think this whole Eve teasing thing is is a very common phenomenon. There's been campaigns against Eve teasing now because, you know, Indian women have decided that they're no longer going to take it and they're going to stand up. And the and what happened after the Delhi gang rape from two years ago showed that to us. Add to your wow factor with Michelle Martin in the Wow Club on 938 Live. More from my guest Ira Trevetti after this. Welcome to Wow! Are Women of Worth? I'm Michelle Martin. We're taking a closer look at the landscape of contemporary India, our sexual ideals, practices, gender placement, so to speak, gender roles are changing. My guest this evening is Ira Trevetti. She was in Singapore to be part of the Singapore Writers' Festival. Her new book is India in Love. It's her first piece of nonfiction and it is terrific. Such a contribution to the canon of work to understand what the changes that are taking place right now in India when it comes to sexual uh, revolution and attitudes towards marriage. Uh, I really enjoyed my chat with Ira Trevetti. And here she is. She's also a yoga teacher. Besides being, uh, you know, having so much under her belt, MBA from Columbia, winner of the Felberg Fellowship, three pieces of fiction uh, that she's put out to the world, her latest book, India in Love, and and to add all that to the mix, uh, why not another title, Yoga Teacher? We find out what yoga has played, the role yoga has played in her life as well. This is wow. What happened after the Delhi gang rape? from two years ago, showed that to us, that, you know, Indian women are no longer going to stand in silence. Did that catalyze the constituency of women standing up for themselves? I think it didn't, I'm not sure it catalyzed. I think it was, it was a sort of climax. You know, it's sort of, it reached a point where these, it was like an eruption of latent anger and latent frustration. That's what happened. Um, Was it a catalyst? I'm not yet sure, mm. but I do think it catalyzed a debate, if nothing else. You know, some laws were changed, some legal actions being taken. It sort of stirred up the government, 
you know. Um, have we seen changes Do you yet? feel safe walking down the streets in New Delhi? I think I feel more unsafe, you know, because you hear about it more, right? I mean, if you never heard that Delhi was unsafe, you may have felt it. I, I, I felt it. I mean, all of us felt it, you know. But now when you're hearing about it constantly, like Delhi's unsafe, 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 it kind of mentally starts affecting you. I mean, I live in, 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 in a government area in Delhi, which is very safe, you know, um, and it's, 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 it's surrounded, you know, go, there's government officials, including the president of India who lives close by. Yet, you know, nine o'clock and I go out for a walk, I'll have my mother calling me saying, where are you? Come back. And I'll say, mom, it's nine. You know, she said, no, I mean, it's dark outside. You have to come back. And this is me in a, probably one of the safest areas in the country, not just in Delhi, mm-hmm. you know, because mm-hmm. of the number of police around. But that's just the way it is. Do you think the the infamous rape that we were just talking about has led to sustained change um, in, in a positive way for women's safety? Um, I don't. I haven't seen changes yet. You know, I think it's too too soon. A country mm-hmm. like India, with its various demographic, you know, it's 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 a complicated country. You know, yeah. it's 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 large as many people, demographics, and um, different cultures within one culture. I think it'll, you know, the legal systems are a little convoluted. Everything takes time. There's um, the judicial systems are, again, complex. How is technology shaping the Indian perspective on love and dating? I think there is it's 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 changed and it's going to change even more in the future. Uh, Apps like Tinder, you know, uh, there's the the vice president of Tinder made some comments like we're, we're you know, we're growing at like the fastest in India than anywhere else or something, something along those lines that the, the speed of growth in India is phenomenal. Um, because, because there's such uh, internet penetration and yeah, mobile phone exactly. penetration. Yeah, exactly. There's such mobile sense. phone p- penetration, internet p- penetration, especially in the middle class. And, you know, there's so many physical boundaries in India still, right? The physical boundaries of your parents, of your homes, those still exist because the older generation still exists. But the internet and the cell phone breaks those boundaries, you can communicate with people online on the phone. You can meet people through through the internet. You don't need to sort of, um, you know, you don't need to meet them to to sort of physically meet them to go on a date with them. You can set up a date online, mm-hmm. and then you can go meet them. So I do think that that Facebook, Tinder, um, things like Planet Romeo have really caused a gay revolution in India. Homosexuality, for example, there's. I think that the homosexual revolution. A big part of it has been the internet because people can come out, they can be anonymous, they can find partners online, which was not possible earlier. Tell me a little bit about your own motivations for writing this book. Was the personal mixed in with the political? Definitely, definitely. I think, you know, I'm... um, I'm part of it. You know, I'm part of a sexual and marriage revolution in India. You're 29 um, and we were just discussing how you're starting to feel the, the pressure to marry. I've been feeling since I was 21, to be honest. I, I mean, I've, I've really sort of, I've had to, I have some very powerful titanium shields around me now, you know, to, to sort of block all the pressure coming in. There's societal pressure, family pressure, pressure from your own self. Because, um, unfortunately, women in India still have expiry dates. And mine is probably long gone, to be honest. In my mind, well, I keep that on... sounds incompatible <laughs> with this idea of so much change happening in the last 10 years. But like 21 women feel pressured to get yeah, married. Yeah, I mean, listen, the age has gone up to 24, maybe from 21, you know, but that's a big change. It was 19, probably, you know, 10, 12 years ago. Um, Is the so, woman still defined by her ability to find a mate? No, not anymore. I don't think so. Mm. Um, I think there's pressure to do it. And I do think that, for example, I'm 29 and I'm not married and there's plenty of my friends who are not married. And while I, 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 you know, I do feel the pressure, if I don't get married, it's OK. You know, it's it's OK. Ten years ago, it would not have been OK. Twenty years ago, it would have been unthinkable. So I do think we've come a long way since 15 to 20 years ago, for sure. Add to your wow factor with Michelle Martin in the Wow Club on 938 Live. You're listening to Wow, a Women of Worth. I'm Michelle Martin. My guest is Ira Trevetti. What a 
wonderful conversation it was. I really, really enjoyed taking a closer look at contemporary Indian society. She's done extensive research, interviewed over 500 individuals, talked to everybody from academics to priests to men, women, uh, individuals who were dating, individuals who were finding love on the cusp of love, falling out of love. Oh, it was just fantastic. India... India comes into focus with Ira Trevedi's new book, India in Love. More from the author herself. Tell me a little bit about why you wanted to write India in Love, your first nonfiction book. I think it was partly because I, it was partly because I was, I saw the changes around me, you know, and I was part of them myself. I saw that the things had really changed. So I moved to New York um, and I studied there. Uh, I was in Boston, then I was in New York, and and I'd left India when I was 17 years old. You know, I'd done finished high school and moved away. And when I came back, um, the India that I saw was very different than the India I'd left behind. It was. This is a space of how many years? This is a space of probably around seven years. Okay. And in seven years, I had seen you know things had changed completely. People were dating. People were having, you know, there's one night stands. Sex wasn't a taboo anymore. People were talking about sex. I never spoke about sex. None of my friends ever spoke about sex. And it was just like the world that I came back to was very different than the world that I'd left behind. And I felt like it required some investigation. Um, I do journalism as well. And as I started doing these stories and meeting people who were really, you know, probably um, the change makers Mm -hmm. of society. Mm -hmm. I, I, I said, I, I'm, I'm on to something here. Um, and I started researching. It took me almost seven months just research to see what I had. It took me se- seven months to just decide to write this book. Um, and then, of course, I, I continued doing this for another three years. But over those seven months, what struck me most was not only was there a sexual revolution happening, but the magnitude of the sexual revolution was startling. You are also, besides an accomplished author and an entrepreneur, you're a yoga teacher. I am. <laughs> what role does yoga play in your life? I'm curious. It plays a pretty important role. You know, I think writing a, on just a physical fitness level, you know, writing is such a sedentary profession. You just, as a writer, you just got to like slug it out sitting at your desk all day. You know, if you really got to get writing, you got to get writing. You work typically at home or in a small place and and it's not like you're going to an office and waking up and going, you just sort of get out of bed, you know, potter about, go sit at your writing desk. So it's it's a sedentary profession. So I think to kind of yoga gave me that sort of, you know, that, that push to be able to, to do that. I also think discipline. Writers um, are very indisciplined creatures because writing is a very tough task to sit down and to actually put word on paper. It's like I've been doing it for 10 years and my brain rebels against it every single time still. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. You know, still. <laughs> because I understand. And, yeah. And, 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 and yoga is part of the discipline. It's, you know, in, in, if you're a writer, you have no boss. You've got no colleagues around you every day. So you've got to continue to self-motivate yourself. And I think yoga has kind of given me, this, it's a disciplining force in my life. That every morning when I woke, wake up, I'm going to do yoga. And even in yoga, it's such a mental exercise that my brain rebels against that too. So when I do yoga, I kind of, it's, 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 a pre- it's preparation for my writing. So I do think that, that, that yoga, of course, it's physical, but mentally as well, it's been extremely important in my life as a writer. I love your book because it shows how new values are, you know, feverishly being made and remade and breaking up and breaking down. Uh, I want to ask you a broad question on the, the topic of feminism. Do you think there are some um, indisputable aspects to feminism or do you believe that there is an emerging model of Asian feminism? So India has never really had this sort of broad burning feminist movement. Um, There's nothing organized. There have been a few, there was few pockets here and there of of sort of a feminist revolution, but there's nothing really like that because India strangely on one hand is a very it's a sort of a feminist country. We worship female gods. We've had female prime ministers. Even today, you look at some of the most important political leaders. They're all women. For many, many years, the, the woman who ran the country was Sonia Gandhi, you know, a woman. So while we are extremely, in a way, feminist, we're also very repressive. 
So because I think it's a, been such a dichotomous, dichotomous culture, we've not yet had a feminist revolution and there's nothing organized as such. But I think it's happening in different ways. You know, I think it's, it's happening in the sense that women are standing up for their rights now um, in every field, whether it's legal, whether it's um, sexual, whether it's economic. And I think it's happening. So India's feminist revolution is more subtle mm -hmm. and more gradual. Mm -hmm. It's an evolution, not a revolution. When you went undercover, or shall I say undercover for your book about yeah. um, the experience of being part of Miss India 2005, the pageant yeah. where you made it to the finals, by the way. Yeah. Uh, wh wh what did you gain from that experience? So I think... Besides the book. Besides the book. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that you know, sold think, really well. Yeah, I think what it was is that I was this... Um, I mean, I was this young girl who'd lived a very sort of particular life. You know, I'd done all the right things and studied and been around people who were also in the same way. And I was sheltered. It was I was 18 and gone to good schools and worked hard to get into a good college in the U.S. and whatnot. And for the first time in my life, I was really meeting people with slightly different, with actually not slightly, very different goals. They had wanted to be beauty pageant winners since they wanted to be beauty queens since they were born basically you know and for me I just didn't get it it was such a different way of thinking here I was kind of thinking how am I going to make an impact and how am I going to help people and you know, these are the sort of values that have been inculcated so it was it was a sharp contrast and that sharp contrast affected me deeply enough to you know to want to write about it because when you write if you don't feel passionately about something or if you don't feel feel deeply about something it's very difficult to write about it deeply so that book was a it was an amateur and novice attempt it was my first book I was 18 19 years old um, I wrote the book in a month but at the same time um, you know I, it was because I felt deeply it was because it was such a stark experience in life for me that I was able to write this book but I hopes for yourself moving forward and for women in India I think um, for myself I just you know, want to potter along writing. <laughs> I think uh, it's that's a great what joy. I, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a great joy. And, and however, you know, much or less my books sell, it still gives me a, you know, a, it, it still gives me um, some very satisfactory feelings when I get an email from a reader saying that, you know, your book has, has helped me or um, your book has made me think. If not even help, it's made me think, you know. And, and that, for me, means so much more. I left the corporate world. I did an MBA. Um, I, you know, worked on Wall Street. But the kind of joy that I get from doing this is, is, is far greater than that. Um, and the kind of impact that I hope that my, my books create at least keeps me writing every day. And your hopes for women in India? I, you know, I think women in India are at a better place today than they were in the past. Um, it's not the best, but it's better. I do think, though, that um, it's also a very complicated place. Uh, a recent survey showed that Indian women are the most stressed out in the whole world. It's because we're constantly still fighting. There's still a lot of tradition in India. There's, at the same time, westernization. There's constant clash. And, and Indian women want to have it all. But I do think that I, I, my, my sincere hope is that I hope Indian women can be happier you know, and less stressed out and take all of this change in their stride. That's what I hope. Ira Trevetti, uh, thank you so much yeah. for being with us. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Add to your wow factor with Michelle Martin in the Wow Club on 938 Live.